where to find the best Halloween costumes at. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We are less than a week away from the start of the NBA season, so we're we're really ramping things up, getting uh, drafts underway, waiver wire moves made, people making way too many trades, of course, at at this point of the season, which is pretty common, and that'll happen throughout the first uh, week or two of the uh, of the regular season as well so don't be surprised when uh when crazy trades go down your league and crazy waiver wire moves get made that is definitely going to be happening at the in this early portion of the season what i'm going to be doing in uh in today's podcast is i'm going to be talking about points leagues now you know that i am not a fan of points leagues but i am going to be talking about them in this podcast i'm also going to be going over some news and notes from around the nba as well so let's get to it to it one quick um news or note, I guess, regarding this podcast, and I'm sure this is going to get a 100% um, thumbs down uh, response. I don't think many people are going to be a fan of this, but for this season, unfortunately, this podcast will be going to five days a week. I won't be doing seven days a week on the podcast anymore. I have been doing that for the last four seasons, but unfortunately, I won't be continuing doing it seven days a week this year, and I'll tell you why. It's obviously a lot of work to do it seven days a week and to do it seven days a week for the last four seasons. Probably about half of the people that listen to this podcast don't listen to it on the weekend anyway, so half the people, it won't affect them anyway. But what it does do is it obviously has a massive, massive impact on my uh, my life to to do this and to do a podcast for an hour and a half a day, which is honestly what happens most of the time on the, on, on the, the regular season shows. It's not an hour and a half of work. It's an hour and a half of recording. It's half an hour of editing, yeah, 20 minutes of posting social media stuff. It's an hour, hour and a half, two hours of preparation work beforehand. So we're talking, you know, five, six hours per day on those weekend days as well, which adds up to quite a bit. Um, I, I do this now to, I guess, try and prevent burnout to some degree. I don't want to just be constantly just going every single day for seven days a week for six consecutive months. It, it is it is hard work and it does get to become a bit of a strain. So I have decided that this season, the Saturday and Sunday shows will be eliminated from the podcast again. I know people are going to be pissed off at that. I do apologize that I have been doing that and, and I won't be continuing, but it does have an impact on my on my life outside of uh, outside of basketball. If big things do happen on the uh, on the weekends, I will do emergency podcasts and, and put those sort of things up, but you won't be getting the full hour and a half show on those Saturdays and Sundays. So again, I do apologize. I know nobody is going to be happy uh, about that news, but it is something that, again, I have to do to maintain the quality, I think, of the rest of the week shows, maintain the quality of what I do over on Basketball Monster, and maintain my sanity and uh, a skerrick of a social and personal life as well. So I do apologize for that, but that is the news that will be happening for this season. Um, let's get into the rest of NBA news that has uh, gone down in the last couple of days. The Hornets, we know that Nikola Batum is now out for six to eight weeks, not the eight to 12 weeks that was initially mentioned. So he does become a little bit more of an interesting player if he's been dropped in your league and you've got an IR spot, go and grab him immediately. Even drafting him though, I still wouldn't be looking outside the or inside the top 100. Same with a guy like uh, Zach Levine, Jabari Parker, even though they're likely to return or they're almost definitely going to return after uh, after Batum. I wouldn't be looking at them inside uh, the top 100. I have the same opinion on Isaiah Thomas as well. Rajon Rondo is out for four to six weeks. I wouldn't be looking at him inside the top 100. With him out, Drew Holiday gets that bump in assists initially, as will DeMarcus Cousins, and we'll see more minutes for Ian Clark and each one more, perhaps Jordan Crawford as well, getting some extra playing time, maybe Darius Miller. But you'll see Cousins, you'll see Holiday get those assist numbers back up and a little bit of value there for Moore or Clark. But that's more for deeper leagues, not for 12-team type of formats. Miles Plumley, not that anyone gives a shit about this one, but he is out for two to three weeks with a quad injury. He wasn't going to be in the rotation anyway, so uh, that's not a big deal. Now, back to the Hornets, talk about Batum out for six to eight weeks. 
Michael Carter-Williams, there is no way, according to Steve Clifford, that he will play in the opener. So that's another player out. Jeremy Lamb is dealing with a groin injury. He may miss opening night. Julian Stone is also dealing with a hamstring problem, as is Trevion Graham. So there are a number of guards and wings that are out on this team. So we're going to have, if Lamb plays, He's going to get big minutes. You're going to have an increased role for Michael Kidd-Gilchrist, maybe an extra minute there, maybe some extra minutes for Marvin Williams uh, as he plays a little bit more at the three, which will then in turn lead to more minutes for Frank Kaminsky at power forward. Also, you also, and we're seeing this today in today's preseason game for the Hornets, Dwayne Bacon is going to start with Jeremy Lamb out. So if Lamb is out and Carter Williams and Batum we know will be out, then you'll see Bacon starting and you'll see a much increased role for Malik Monk running in that second uh, unit. So if we hear that Lamb's out for the first week of the season, Monk then becomes a really, really good pickup for that first week. And what I'll do at the start of next week, I'm going to do a weekly preview for seasonal leagues. That's the schedule for next week. Actually, I'll talk about that quickly now. Monday, we're going to do a weekly schedule preview, a waiver wire pick pick up sort of situation for the start of the start of the season. So that'll be on Monday. On Tuesday will be the DFS preview for Wednesday's games, and then on Wednesday, it's balls to the wall with the standard uh, standard shows that we do during the regular season: half on seasonal leagues, half on DFS, and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll do that in a similar format to last season, but that's what we're going to be doing next week. Joel Embiid is back. He is playing in today's preseason game. It'll be limited, of course, so that means he is going to be back for the preseason opener. That is fantastic. Well, the regular season opener, sorry. That is obviously fantastic news. I didn't really have any doubt about that, and you know that I'm super excited about him for this season, and I'm probably more optimistic about Embiid than most people. It could very, very easily come back and bite me in the ass, but at this point, I'm feeling a level of confidence in Embiid thinking that he could be a top 10 guy this season. I think, he, I think he'll almost definitely be a top 10 guy post-All-Star break. I, I feel pretty confident in that. I think that the minutes will be a little bit limited early on, and that will that'll limit his overall value, but he is going to fly home, assuming that nothing goes wrong. And uh, I think I think we should feel okay about that. Injuries can happen at any point, but I'm feeling pretty good about Embiid this season. Thon McCurr is back in practice, so he'll likely be ready for the opening night uh Lineup for the Bucks most likely starting there as well. And one thing that's happening in Boston, we've got Aaron Baines who has a knee sprain. Marcus Morris who is a fat, B terrible. Jason Tatum is going to start today's game. Jason Tatum, I think, is really putting himself into the position to be the uh, opening night starter at power forward for this team. You know that I don't think Marcus Morris is any good. I think they should start Baines there. But if Baines is limited and Morris is struggling... I think that, uh, I think, but um, not Batum, uh, Tatum, that's the guy I'm looking for. I think that Tatum is going to be the opening night starter at power forward for this Celtics team. And that gives him a significant level of intrigue to go and grab off that waiver wire or draft with your last pick to see how it's going to work out for him. Because if he gets his hooks into that starting role, I'm not sure he's going to give it up. Now, he probably won't play 30 plus. He might play 25, 26. Morris works in there, a bit of Bainsy there as well. But I reckon there's a significant chance that, uh, that um, Tatum is the, uh, is the opening night starter with Morris being so far behind in terms of talent level and in terms of overall fitness and Baines struggling with that knee problem. The Lakers' Lonzo Ball is being held out of preseason, preseason with his ankle injury. I think there's a chance that he is not ready for the regular season opener. We already have Kentavious Caldwell Pope, who won't play the first two games due to a suspension, so that backcourt's a real mess. So Jordan Clarkson, who's not someone I like at all for this season, he is going to have value for those first two games at least, even if Lonzo plays. If he doesn't, then Tyler Ennis becomes your streamer. Clarkson gets a massive boost in value. You'll have Brandon Ingram playing some more minutes because he is definitely, definitely at risk of losing minutes to Kyle Kuzma, who is continuing to play really well and, and put up numbers. He's not putting up peripheral stats. The rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, they're not really there for Kuzma, but he's going to get playing time. We saw him play. He outplayed Larry Nance again. He outplayed Julius Randle again. I am not the biggest Julius Randle fan, and by that I mean I'm probably the lowest on the Julius Randle fandom totem pole. But there's a significant chance that I think we see Nance starting over Randle and Kuzma playing ahead of him in the in the rotation. We've seen that in the last um, last preseason game. That that's a real possibility. I also think that we might. Uh, I don't think Bogut's going to be in the rotation for the Lakers. You might see Zubats there, or you'll have Randle as the backup center, and you could have Kuzma taking away some Ingram's minutes on the wing because Ingram has been shit like he was for the majority of last season. Hasn't really done much good here. I know he's 20. I'm not giving up on him, but he is not good. At this point, so Kuzma's getting some value, but we do need to remember that you know, so much of his you know, value is coming from points and coming from uh, from usage, and it's not coming from other categories, and that tends to be 
something that might be an issue once the regular season starts. If he's not getting those other peripheral numbers, then the scoring and all that sort of stuff may drop off. But it is something to watch with Lonzo potentially out for the opening night game and Contavious Coel Pope definitely out. That could open up Ennis, Clarkson, Ingram gets a minutes as a ball handler as well, and that would mean more minutes for Kuzma there on the wing. So lots of different opportunities there with the Los Angeles Lakers. I'll give this a quick mention now as well. Tomorrow, really, really special podcast. I hope... I don't, I don't want to announce who it is that's coming on just in case it falls through, but I'll say that it is an announcer, a broadcaster from an extraordinarily popular team, a team that's going to have many questions about it this season, and I'll be answer, asking those questions of this particular announcer for that super, super popular team. So uh, stay tuned for that. It'll be myself and Kyle speaking with this, uh, with this particular announcer if everything goes to plan. And I think that a large portion of you will be, or I think everyone will be really interested in it, but especially a large portion of you that happen to uh, support this team will be really interested to hear the thoughts of this particular announcer that is coming on tomorrow's podcast. Now let's talk about points leaks. We know the NBA introduced an official point scoring format, and they did that to try and get you know, consistency. ESPN has it as their default scoring. Yahoo has it as their default scoring. FanDuel in DFS has it as their default scoring. DraftKings doesn't. They're, they're sticking with their old system. So it's a common system amongst ESPN, Yahoo, and uh, and FanDuel now. So seasonal and DFS are you know, melding together in terms of that scoring system. It's an idea to try and bring more people into fantasy basketball. You're seeing guys like Rod Beard of the Detroit News, a beat reporter who's really embracing fantasy this season. He's putting out fantasy-specific articles just before tip, maybe videos as well, just talking about you know what's going to happen from a fantasy point of view, how I see your know, minutes rotations going for these guys from what he understands from talking to Van Gundy. And hopefully that spurs other beat reporters on from other teams to provide this sort of content. So massive shout out to Rod Beard. Go and follow Rod Beard on Twitter because he is a beat reporter who, re- reporter who is tailoring what he does for fantasy and for DFS and he's putting out articles as well. So really great stuff from Rod. I've been speaking to him today. Um, and he's been he's putting out great stuff. I really love where he's going with all of this, and it's a, a really breath of fresh air into the beat reporter situation. And I've had a, a few media people, other media people, reach out to me that are doing fantasy this season as well and are utilizing Basketball Monster and really getting into it. So the NBA is growing it. So that's the point of this, is to get people into it. Now, in saying that, I still hate points leagues. I hate them. I think they are terrible, but I understand them as a first go-round for people getting into it. Play in a points league. And then transition to a category league because they are, in my mind, yeah, 10 times better at least. What we did the other day, Kyle McEwen uh, set up an official points league um, expert draft for Basketball Monster. He's written an article on that over on Basketball Monster we can check out. We had Tom Carpenter from ESPN, myself, Greg and Kyle from Basketball Monster, Zach Ruiz from The Fantasy Fix, uh, Joey Mamoni from Hashtag Basketball and Mark Roberts from Hashtag Basketball, Russell Peddle from Number Fire, uh, Andre Snellings, Shannon McEwen, Alex Raclean and Alex Barutha from Rotowire in there as well. So all people who live and breathe uh, fantasy basketball doing this draft. It was a standard um, 12-team, 13-man roster with one center. We're actually playing this league out. We've got weekly weekly lineups, one injured reserve spot, head-to-head points um, with that standard scoring system, which, if you're unaware, it is one point for every point scored, 1.2 points for every rebound, 1.5 points for every assist, three points for every steal, three points for every block, and negative one points for every turnover. So that's the way it works. There's no missed points for inefficiency for field goals uh, missed or free throws missed or anything like that. So it does change the value significantly of certain players. Now, I had the seventh pick in this draft. I'm going to go through who I selected with each of my picks and uh, and, and show you, you know, what selections I made. But you know, I did this draft, and many of you, you, you might be able to relate, you might not be able to relate. I was bored as shit. Like just sitting there, there is literally no strategy whatsoever in a in a points league draft. Like I've got the draft tracker set up, I'm looking at it, and you just go, "Well, who's at the top of my list here?" Oh, cool. I'll just take this guy. I don't need to worry about balancing categories. What I can do is, I guess the strategy comes in like, okay, this guy's projected at 28.5, and this guy's projected at 28.2, but I think that this play is a little bit more risky at 28.5. Maybe I take the the solid guy at 28.2, and then when I get down to round nine, I take the guy that, even though they're projected the same, who's got the higher upside? Let's take that player. 
And the other element of strategy, which is minimal, is filling out your positions, just making sure you've got someone to start in every uh, in every position in your starting lineup, especially. So that's the way yeah, that I look at it. But it, just in terms of the actual draft itself, like it didn't worry me. Oh, I wanted this guy. Cool, you sniped him. That's okay. The next three guys in my list are projected to score 0.2 points less per game. So what's the difference? This is why I just I, I just cannot get behind points leagues. I find them extraordinarily boring. But again, I understand why people play them. I understand why this is introduced as a standard thing. But if you are playing a points league, I implore you to try a category league. The draft is a hundred times more fun. The league is a hundred times more fun, and and it just there is so much more to be done. Like I was sitting there in this draft, just going, "All right, cool. Well, this guy's gone. Who's the next? I'll just take the next guy." Anyway, there was just no thought process, no thinking. None of those reactions that you see me have reactions in auction drafts or snake drafts when someone takes my guy and I lose my shit. It's like, oh, he's, uh, I needed that guy. He's going to do what, exactly what I need. And this one's like, oh, well, well, let's, let me give you an example of when that happened. Um, uh, let's find a, one of my picks that that happened in. I think, um, oh, yeah, I, I wanted uh, in round five, Victor Oladipo was there. I wanted him. Um, and two picks ahead of me, Shannon McEwen took him. And I went, all right, that's fine. I'll just take the next guy who, who ended up being Clint Capella. That was all right. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll just take the next guy. It doesn't really bother me. I wasn't wasn't looking at it. You're just going, oh, you, you bastards, you took the guys I wanted. Aaron Gordon. Yeah, Zach took him two spots ahead of me. I wanted him. But, oh, well, I'll just take my next guy, who was Dennis Smith. That's, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. There's no categorical diversity in these guys. Now, you've, I know it feels like I'm just bashing points league consistently, which I am. Um, but my experience in doing this draft was just one of just... I was just not engaged. It just doesn't engage me. There's just... My brain doesn't have to work at full capacity doing these drafts. It's just, I'll take the next guy. Now... It is all about, you know, to a degree in the latter, latter rounds, oh, who's going to have more upside? Who's going to be a guy that maybe breaks out? and Or do I want to mitigate risk in some of my earlier picks? That's all fine. But there's no like dynamism in the draft. Like, it's, oh, this guy's gone. Oh my God, I've got to pivot everything I'm doing. It just doesn't work that way. There's just none of that dynamism, none of that you know, strategy basing on what other people are doing as well. Cool, I'll just get this guy because he scores points. That's it. That's, that's as simple as it gets. Now, again, I had pick seven and I took DeMarcus Cousins with pick seven. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, in my second round pick, I ended up with Kyrie Irving at pick 18, which I thought was a fantastic value to get him there. Pick 31 was my third round pick. I had Marc Gasol there. Really happy with that one. I was happy with all my picks pretty much. Round four, pick 42 overall. Bradley Beal, loved that Bealy um, slipped down to that spot. Really happy with that one. At pick 55 in round five, Clint Capella, as I mentioned, I did want Oladipo there, but uh, Clint fell and free throws don't matter in a, in a league like that, like this, so that's fine. Round six, pick 66, big Dennis Smith Jr., really interested in him there. His inefficiency problems, his turnovers, well, his turnovers doesn't matter a bit, but when they're minus one, maybe he averages four a game, that's four points off, big deal. If he scores 18 points, then... Yeah, 18 points per game, and that's totally fine to give him his, uh, to give him his fantasy value. Loved him at 66 there. Uh, in round seven, I had picked 79. Timmy Hardaway was my guy. Again, I think he's really suited to a points league with his volume scoring, so I loved getting him at that spot. Round eight, I took Rondé Hollis Jefferson at pick 90. Um, you might think it's a bit high for Rondé because he doesn't score that much, but the fact that he's going to get out of position blocks and steals and high rebounds, which are all valued highly in this points league, pushes him up to that spot, and I really liked him. Um, the pick after him was Willie Cauley-Stein, Ennis Cantor. There are a couple of guys who I did debate there, but I, I really wanted to get Rondé. I think I needed a small forward at that spot as well. Pick 103, my boy Marcus Smart. Field goal percentage, who gives a shit? Doesn't matter. Don't need to worry about it. His assists, his steals, his minutes, his points. Really, really like Smart there at 103. Round 10, 114. I thought this was just a safe, solid pick, and that's Wilson Chandler. I feel good about the minutes he's getting. Yeah, the hip is a little bit of a bother. The upside is limited, but I'll get my upside guys in these next couple of rounds. Well, that's what I hope to do anyway. And in round 11, I took the uh, I took the Undertaker. As much as I love Dwayne Dedman, I'm probably regretting this one a little bit because it was between him and Joshy Richardson on my board. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I love Joshy. Um, do I grab him? And then I was just thinking about the Heat. And the Heat's rotation is such a nightmare to figure out. There's the iron shoulder, Goran Dragic. There's Dion Waiters. There's Scooter Magruder. Is that the starting one, two, three? It appears that it's going to be. Then on the bench, you've got Tyler Johnson. You've got Joshy Richardson. You've got Justice Winslow. 
right? These are just the one, two, three. And then you've got the Duke, Wayne Ellington. So that's seven guys to fit into three positions. How the hell are these minutes going to break down? Unless Winslow is going to be playing exclusively as a four. And to be honest, Winslow's minutes, I think, are going to be significantly reduced this season. Especially if, if Scooter starts, then Winslow is not going to play 30 minutes a night, I don't think. I think he's going to struggle to. Richardson, again, I think he's the best wing on this team. The... Um, the waiter's angle injury, I think, is a significant problem, and that could limit him. And I think you're going to see big numbers from Richo, but is his 34-minute upside there? Yeah, I don't think it is. And Deadman's clearly not going to play 34 minutes, but that, that's my only concern with Richo is just there's seven guys who are going to be in the rotation to play the 1-2-3 with Olenek, Jimmy Johnson, and Hassan Whiteside playing the minutes at the 4 and the 5. So that is a, a level of concern. In round 12, at pick 138, I don't think there's much upside in Marvin Williams there, but shit. I think it's great, great numbers, and I'm, I don't care if he doesn't you know, break out. Even if he's solid, that I think that was great value for me to get him there. And with my last selection at pick 151, I took Bogdan Bogdanovich, and actually about five minutes before I started this podcast, I dropped Bogdan, and I picked up Justin Holiday, the go-to scorer, uh, fresh off his 28 and 11 game. The 11 rebounds is an absolute anomaly, but I think that Justin Holiday is a very strong late pick. Yeah, he probably drops off a bit when Zach Levine comes back, but that's likely going to be end of December, start of January. And Holiday could still maintain a role. I would much prefer they give Denzel Val- Valentine those minutes. Valentine played really well as well. But for now, I'm, uh, I'm riding with Holiday there. Still think that Valentine is going to have some value uh, as a pick as well. So that's the way that my uh, my draft went with, uh, with, those, uh, with those selections in that points league, the official scoring. Now, what I'm going to do now... Um, I'm going to uh, go, let's go through, I guess, players who get a significant bump as opposed to their nine category or eight category value uh, versus in this standard points league scoring format. Because again, we're removing the field goal percentage component. We're removing free throw percentage component. We're changing the calculus and how everything is uh, is valued. I think that Russell Westbrook is the number one player in a points league of this format. You could make the argument to take Yanni there. Uh, Anthony Davis also in the mix also. But the biggest gainer to me is DeMarcus Cousins, who's a player who's going at the end of the first round, start of the second round in most cases. But according to my projections, he's the fourth overall player in a league like that scores like this. So at pick seven, I was absolutely ecstatic to get him. He's better than James Harden in this sort of a format, marginally. I think he's significantly better than Carl Anthony Towns, as Towns' value really comes from his elite field goal percentage and free throw percentage. They're two of his strongest categories, and they mean jack shit in this format. You could say the same thing for Kevin Durant, who loses value in this format too. And Steph Curry actually drops outside the top 12 in this sort of scoring format due to the fact that, you know, three-pointers, they only count as points. There's no additional category there for him. Plus, his elite efficiency doesn't really help. Kawhi Leonard is also a player who drops down. So instead of that standard top eight that we talk about, the top eight that I have projected for a points league setup like this is Westbrook, it's Davis, it's Yarny, it's Boogie, Jim Harden, LeBron, Townsy, and John Wall comes in at number eight. So you've got Durant out of that mix. You've got Kawhi out of that mix. You've got Steph out of that mix uh, as opposed to a category league. Look at some other players who take some decent size jumps up. Damian Lillard becomes a first-round player. Not that, look, he could potentially be one already, but he takes a leap up to become that first-round guy. Blake Griffin takes a massive, massive leap forward to be a guy that is challenging to be a back end of the first round, start of the second round type of player in this format. A really big jump from him. Marcus Gasol, I think, takes a, a, a decent step forward as well, as does DeMar DeRozan, who takes a really significant leap forward in this sort of a setup. Um... Guys like um, yeah, uh, Porzingis, Porzingis, Miles Turner, they're still about the same sort of value. Where you get the real big jumps, Andre Drummond, who has been hitting his free throws at a weird amount in preseason. Who knows if that's going to stick, but he has been putting up great numbers. He is a strong second to third round guy in this sort of a this sort of a scoring format. Yusuf Nurkic also gets that bump. Uh, as well, and Rudy Gobert becomes a strong first-round target. These are these punt free throw guys, and we take that part away from their game. And Gobert was an absolute monster yesterday on, on offense. He's putting up big numbers. He is going to be really, really good this year if you're willing to deal with his free throw percentage. A couple of other guys who I think gain some value, obviously DeAndre Jordan's one of those players. Ricky Rubio probably loses a bit of value just with the uh, the assists value dropping a bit, but he's still a strong you know, fourth round type of a player. Paul George, I believe, loses value in this format. Uh, Draymond Green loses a significant amount of value also, and Kyle Lowry drops uh, to a degree. Um, CJ McCollum, I think a lot of his value comes from his really high field goal percentage, so his value drops off a bit, as does Bradley Beal, who I said I was able to get in that um, 
in that fourth round, but that's that's sort of about where he is, and I really like the value of uh, Lord Alfred Payton, Ben Simmons, and Aaron Gordon. All those guys become top 50 in this sort of a scoring format, as does Devin Booker. Um, I think Mallow is is a better option in this sort of a, in this sort of a format. Al Horford loses a bit of value, and Jeremy Lin becomes a real monster, I believe. Um, yeah, I think he's a comfortable top 60 player who you don't have to draft in that sort of a position. Clay Thompson is another player who loses you know, quite a chunk of value, as does Chris Middleton in a league like this, just because of the way the scoring sets up. Lonzo Ball also loses just a, just a touch of value, not too much there. While Andrew Wiggins is a player who jumps up significantly from a guy that might be an 80 or 90 ranked guy after he signed that extension today. He can become a, a top 60, top 65 sort of a player as with Dennis Smith, as with Markel Fultz. A lot of these uh, rookies like Fultz and Smith and Simmons, the efficiency problems is mitigated in this sort of a scoring system. Other players who drop, Otto Porter is a guy that loses value, whereas Marquise Chris, Willie Cauley-Stein, and Julius Randle all get a bit of a bump, as does Ennis Cantor, while, uh, while my man... Nice, he drops as well. I think he's outside the top 70 in this sort of a format. If you get him at 70, that's still fine, but you know, people will be reaching into the 50s. He loses value in this system. I've already talked about Rondé getting a boost uh, where I drafted him. I think Miritich, the pencil, Harrison Barnes, Dirk Nowitzki, they get bumps in their value in this scoring system also. Um, Serge Barker, I think, loses a lot. Um, a lot of his value is, is a, a high free throw percentage big man, so he loses some value. Bob Cove loses some value as well, whereas Rocket Rodney Hood takes a big, big step forward, as does Reggie Jackson, guys who should be you know, pretty comfortable top 100 players in a, in a scoring system like this. I think Jim Johnson loses value. I think Malcolm Brogdon loses value. Um, and, and a guy like Jamal Murray, I think, also loses a, a level of value in a, in a scoring format like this. I really like Michael Kidd-Gilchrist. He gets some uh, bump here in this sort of a scoring format, as does uh, a guy like Tyreek Evans. Um, Johnny Collins, a little bit of a boost there also. And a lot of these other late-round guys, they're, they're tending to slide a bit like um, uh, like your... Which guy I'm looking at here? Like your, your Kent Bazemore, your Darren Collis, and they're losing a couple of rounds of value in this sort of scoring system. So that's the way that I look at this. Obviously, we've got projections for all this over on Basketball Monster, but it does change the value of many players, especially those punt free throw guys, Drummond, Gobert, Nurkic, Jordan, Howard, Capella, all those guys gets bump, get bumps, and your punt field goal percentage, especially your rookies, your Dennis Smiths, Lonzo Balls, Markel Fultz, Ben Simmonses, uh, Donovan Mitchell perhaps as well, who was a monster yesterday, but we have to remember in that game where Mitchell went off that Rocket was out with some neck soreness. I think at this point that Mitchell is going to be the primary backup at the one and the two ahead of Hull Neto, and it should be able to net him at least 20 minutes a game uh, this season. I think getting him 27 a night is going to be a struggle, um, but he could easily play over Tarbo. The, the Jazz rotation, much like the Heat rotation, is quite a tough one to figure out. Shit, pretty much all the league is a tough rotation to figure out at the moment. There are so many you know, quality depth pieces in the league, except if you play for the Chicago Bulls. But even then, their rotation is hard. What's Larry Markinen going to do, who went off and scored about 18 points in a quarter the other uh, in yesterday's game? Yeah, Bob Portis, where's he there? Chris Felicio, who's the backup center? I think it might be Portis. What is Nikola Mirotic going to do? Where's Denzel going to play? Who's going to be the backup point guard with Jaron Grant, the only healthy guy there? It's going to have to be Denzel Valentine. There's just a lot of questions on all these uh, all these teams in terms of their rotation, and most of them are due to increased depth. We've got three quality power forwards in LA, Randall, Nance, and Kuzma. You've got Ingram at the three. You've got Zubats, Bogut, and Lopez at the five. It's so many options for so many teams that figuring out rotations is going to be quite a tough thing, and I am trying to do that at the moment in order to get all the uh, daily and weekly projections up on Basketball Monster, as well as all the initial DFS stuff, which should be up pretty pretty soon, and I'm going to be constantly tinkering with that as we see more stuff go down over the preseason. As I said, points leagues, I don't like them. The draft was not for me. I, I did not like the draft at all. I did not like the experience of the draft, but it's not me necessarily bagging you guys that play points leagues because I know why you do. But try something else. Try a category league as well. 
You might not be able to convince your league mates to do it, but just branch out. You know, join a Red Rock Listener League next season. Sign up um, to a, a free category league just to try it out this season. I am 100% sure that you will really enjoy it, and the level of strategy is much higher. And I completely understand why points leagues exist and why people play them and why the NBA introduced this standard scoring. And I'm glad they brought in this standard scoring. I think it's really good to have that because that was one of the things people go, in a points league, who do I want better? And my answer is, I've got no idea because I don't know what your scoring system is. Are you losing point negative 0.75 for a for a missed field goal? Are you getting a, a 0.3 triple-double multiplier? Whatever bullshit setting, setting you had. Everyone's league was different. Now, in a points leagues, if you're going with a standard setting, then it's very easy for me to give value there. So... I think that people should be uh, should be starting to uh, starting to look at that if they want more um, more advice on points leagues. I think we are done for this podcast again. Tomorrow's special edition episode. Fingers crossed, everything goes uh, goes well and we get that done. There's some uh, some pretty good information from a true NBA insider. We'll be talking to uh, that person tomorrow, hopefully. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore Beeble and subscribe to this podcast on Google Play, on Apple Podcasts, on TuneIn, on Stitcher, and on Spotify. And if you leave a review, I'll be your best friend. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Dakari Johnson.